All right, man. Yeah, we're ready to go. I just want to let you know that there's some possibility that during the recording session today, the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to knock on my door. Really? You see them outside? No, it's Saturday morning, and they've been coming by on a regular basis. Oh, really? Uh, when I lived in Iowa, the Jehovah's Witnesses came by, and I didn't know this, but apparently uh, they're very opposed to blood donation. Uh <laughs> so, yeah, never invite vampires who love blood into your house or Jehovah's Witnesses who hate blood into your house. Um, I just don't know how to manage this situation, you know, because I'm trying to be polite no, and I'm not no, as no. forceful as I should no, be. I think you just don't answer the door. I mean, you, it, it's not like it's not like you're. But they can see me inside sometimes. Yeah, they're used to it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> You know, like, I mean, isn't it worse to open the door and give them false hope, right? Like, uh, you know, to. I guess I didn't really understand that that's what I was doing. I'm naive to this whole world. I just talked to them about like speed limits on I-90. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then they, they hand me some flyers and they've tried to show me this YouTube video a couple of times. Oh, boy. And I politely yeah, decline. And then they're on their yeah, way. don't. So no advice on how to handle it? Just don't ever answer the door again? Yeah, that's what I... That's the, I just that's don't it. answer the door. Cool. Um, you want to talk about billionaires in the news? Yeah, billionaires in the news. Let's go. Billionaires in the news. So... Billionaires in the news this week. The Cathedral of Notre Dame. It caught on fire and the spire is completely destroyed. And the the controversy uh, with billionaires or the way the billionaires got into the news uh, around that uh, event this week was that within mere moments uh, of Notre Dame burning, uh, over a billion dollars U.S. was raised from uh, so-called charitable giving uh, from uh, incredibly rich people. And a lot, there was a lot of backlash uh, against that. Um, I don't know if you had thoughts on that. Do you, do you want to? Yeah. I mean, well, I think the back, the reason for the backlash is kind of obvious. There are a lot of things that you could be giving money to that would be helpful to starving people and people dealing with unbelievable pain and suffering all over the planet. That's not like a fancy building. Right. I think that's, I think that's basically it, right? It's like, Oh, you know, so the billionaires are always sort of complaining, like they don't want to give one extra cent to uh, uh, more than they're more than is ripped from them from uh, taxation. They're constantly, you know, talking about how uh, uh, how difficult it is to, you know, maintain a business in this kind of atmosphere that's taxing them so much, et cetera, et cetera. And then like something happens and they can give, you know, uh, 200 billion or 200 million euros to, uh, you know, fixing this church. The bigger point is like, why do billionaires love buildings so much? And why do they love putting their names on buildings so much? Crazy. I mean, it is a pretty yeah. specific well, thing. We're going to talk about that with, uh, with Jimmy Haslam, who's one of the billionaires that we're talking about today, uh, who uh, uh, donated $50 million to the University of Tennessee. And now the um, uh, University of Tennessee has a Haslam school of business. Uh, uh, they like, and, and so many billionaires do this. So like, uh, sports teams and uh, schools of business are two of the big vanity projects that billionaires uh, uh, do. They love, you know, like I think that says a lot about capitalism. Yeah, it does. I mean, it does. It's very weird, right? Like, and I think that you can compare it to the Notre Dame thing, right? like the or the Notre Dame, right? We're not talking about the football team um, uh, thing. Uh, because yeah, it's like my money uh, built this structure that is going to outlast me, and 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 of course, somewhere inside of the the cathedral, uh, their names will be inscribed as chair, you know, uh, for all time as part of the, you know, uh, right alongside the Catholic relics, you know, like I, yeah. I mean, I guess it's a pretty old thing too, you know. I mean, we have the Parthenon, we have the Pantheon, we have the pyramids, we have you know all of these sorts of yeah yeah buildings from antiquity. It's what it's what rich people do. They build buildings. Right. Yeah, it's very uh, uh, Ozymandias syndrome, I guess you could call it. Um, but they have that, right? Like, they have it big time. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I think that, like, I think as Americans, it's like, oh, okay, you know, there's there's some real irony and the, the, the cynicism of billionaires really comes to the surface in moments like this. But, like, uh, in France right now, uh, the, the Gilets jaunes, uh, the yellow vest movement, 
uh, is happening, which is uh, I, I've read, you know, some people are calling it like the biggest uh, and uh, uh, most violent protest since uh, May 68, uh, like a major protest movement uh, against wealth inequality, specifically targeting uh, billionaires not paying their fair t- their fair share in taxes is currently happening. So, you know, like that's it. Right. Like it's just there's a there's an inconsistency right in their behavior that everyone sees and it's completely obvious. Uh, there's a hypocrisy and it's it's infuriating. You want to do Stanley Druckenmiller first? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I think like in the trailer and the first episode, I can't remember. You're just sort of you're making a point about how like uh, billionaires aren't really that interesting. Uh-huh. A lot of yeah. them. I think Druckenmiller is the a case study that proves that point. You know, but I mean, it's sort of like we talk about different kinds of billionaires on the show. There's the billionaires who are born billionaires and the billionaires that are become billionaires. I mean, so there's like, there's one kind of privilege and then there's another kind of sure. privilege. You know, Druckenmiller, he grew, he grew up in suburban Philadelphia and then lived in like New Jersey and Virginia. He went to Bowdoin. He got a degree in economics and English and then started a PhD program in econ at the University of Michigan and drops out, starts um, a job as an oil analyst in Pittsburgh. And that kind of leads him into the financial industry mm-hmm. where he starts his own firm, Duquesne Capital. Uh, Druckenmiller starts working with George Soros in the late 80s, early 90s. Soros hires him to oversee the quantum fund. And the, the biggest thing that happens in that relationship is in the early 90s, they famously figured out how to short the British pound and made an insane amount of money. Druckenmiller goes out on his own in 2000. And for the next 10 years, he he's, he's running Duquesne Capital, which is a hedge fund. And he's Printing returns that are some of the, the the best returns in all of the financial world. Um, his his hedge fund makes consistently thirty percent returns each year, wow. putting him in the ultra elite class of hedge fund managers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you're a if you're a financial geek who's interested in researching wizards of the financial right. market, you'll likely know who Druckenmiller is because he's famous for having these high rates of right. return. But um, what is there to talk about? Yeah, I mean, so like, yeah, they're often going to be boring, right? And so I think that then like the, you know, the recourse that we have is to talk about uh, the the kinds of industries that they're involved in. Because, you know, as we've said, I think a number of times, neither of us have a background in, in economics or finance. And so a lot of the a, a lot of that sort of stuff is, is stuff that we're learning along the way. Uh, and I and I get the sense that, like, you know, a, a lot of people in the world don't don't know about right. that stuff. Like we all know we all have heard of hedge funds and we all have some sort of mental picture of what a hedge fund guy looks like. Um, but do we know much about the history of hedge funds or how they work uh, or, uh, uh, you know, why they exist in the first place. Uh, So maybe we could talk about that. We can talk a little bit about the history of hedge funds, if you want. Yeah, I would. Basically, what I've learned in preparation for this episode is that hedge funds only became a thing in the world in the early 1940s. This was a moment in U.S. history where we were coming out of the New Deal and there had been a slew of new financial regulations in response to the stock market crash of the late 1920s and the Great Depression. And the government was trying to step in to figure out ways of regulating the market so that economic catastrophe did not repeat itself. So in the early 1940s, there was a series of acts that were passed that basically created the conditions that allowed for hedge funds to emerge. Uh-huh. And the key thing is that hedge funds emerged from a kind of loophole in the legislation that allowed for wealthy investors to engage in a kind of risk taking that would be illegal for uh, your your 
regular investors, your investors that didn't have a lot of money. So ultimately, while the loopholes are a little bit more complicated than this, the main loophole that allowed for hedge funds to come into the world basically states that if you have fewer than 100 investors, and these investors are all rich, have something like more than a million dollars, notwithstanding, not counting their real estate, then you can establish a fund that can buy equities that aren't subjected to the regulations that everyone else is subjected to. And the idea is that because you're rich, you are regarded by the government as a quote, and this is the actual term, a quote, sophisticated investor, which basically means we trust that you can handle whatever risky behavior you choose to get yourself into, and we're not going to regulate you. So... There's that. It became an opportunity for wealthy investors to avoid certain kinds of regulations and engage in certain privileged investment strategies. Originally, the whole kind of point of a hedge fund, as the name hedge fund implies, was to hedge risk, to minimize exposure in the marketplace. And they would do this by having diverse investment portfolios where they would go long on certain stocks and short on other stocks and and accordingly insulate themselves from vicissitudes of the marketplace. Yeah, I think I, I get it. So like uh, what I'm understanding or what I'm getting from what you're saying is that like uh, the original idea uh, behind hedge funds was a way to uh, mitigate risk uh, for uh, people who were doing a lot of investing. Is that okay. correct? Yeah. Um, so did we get to like, like, what is, what is the advantage? How, do, how does risk get minimized with a hedge fund? So, or maybe not minimized, but like more distributed. Um, is it just because you're investing with a group of people and the risk is distributed between you or? I think it's partially that, but it's also the fact that you're placing different kinds of bets. You're, you're betting that some stocks are going to lose value and some stocks are going to gain value. And, and by creating these sort of diverse portfolios, if you're wrong in certain bets, you're going to be right in other bets. And on balance, you're going to come out ahead. Interestingly, though, over time, hedge funds turned into something completely different. Especially by the 1990s, hedge funds, rather than being funds that were explicitly designed to mitigate risk, were increasingly firms that were explicitly designed to maximize returns. And this sort of uh, hyper emphasis on uh, maximizing, producing the highest rate of return possible became the standard for the hedge fund industry over the last few decades. I mean, that's that's interesting. I mean, I, I did a little bit of, of research into uh, uh, the tax laws around hedge funds, which are uh, uh, very disturbing. So we've already sort of like established that uh, you need to be rich to participate in hedge funds in the first place. I think uh, from what I read, most uh, minimum buy-ins to a hedge fund start at a half million dollars uh, and, you know, and the sky is the limit. Um, uh, hedge funds are a kind a weird kind of entity. They're not corporations, like they're not traditional businesses. They're what's called a pass through entity. Um, and what that means is that the hedge fund is just sort of something that money passes through, right? <laughs> which it passes from the market to the investor, or they call it the partner in the hedge fund. Um, mm -hmm. like a corporation, as we know, has to pay taxes, right? Like they, uh, this is what I was saying earlier, like, you know, corporations are sort of artificial individuals. And so they have to pay taxes, uh, uh, as you know, uh, a corporate entity. Um, but, uh, hedge funds don't have to do that. Uh, uh they're limited partnerships. Uh, they are not themselves taxed. Uh, but rather the the partners or investors uh, are taxed as individuals on the profits that they get from the hedge fund. Um, but right. those that money that they get from investing in the hedge fund is not counted as income. Uh, it's counted as capital gains. And so it's taxed at a much, much lower rate 
than uh, than income would be, right? And so that's the the sort of like capital gains tax thing that you hear people talking about. Um, these people are getting income from investments, uh, but they're able to classify it as a different kind of capital uh, and thus uh, have to pay much lower taxes on it than they otherwise would. So another wrinkle here that's interesting to know about is the compensation structure for hedge fund managers Yeah, is what's known as a two and 20 compensation structure, meaning that the hedge fund managers charge a flat 2% fee of all the assets that they manage. And they get that no matter what, but then they get 20% of any profits earned. And those 20% uh, uh, that that 20% of profits earned, it's my understanding that those earnings are taxed as capital gains and so at, at a lower tax yeah. rate. And so that structure is a, a, essentially a tax evasive kind of compensation structure from the very yeah. beginning. Uh, and not, not to, you know, this is not even to mention uh, stuff that, w- that you've likely heard about, uh, dear listener, but we're not going to talk about today, like the carried interest loophole. Um, and another one that you might not have heard about, the Bermuda reinsurance loophole. Um, uh, these things allow... Uh, there, you know, so like not only is the compensation structure uh, uh, functioning in a way to avoid taxes, and not only is the classification of income as capital gains, ta- uh, capital gains, a way to avoid taxes, but also there are weird loopholes that have been lobbied for uh, uh, by various entities, uh, uh, both financial and state actors. Like Bermuda is one of the biggest lobbyists for this, um, uh, but it also applies to the Cayman Islands and several other places. Uh, there, like, there are, you know, like a a bushel load of different ways in which uh, people who invest in hedge funds can avoid paying taxes, um, and so like we hear a lot about how corporations avoid paying taxes. You know, like Amazon gets tax rebates and things like that, but. Uh, uh, but, uh, 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 this, you know, applies equally, if not more so to hedge funds and, uh, and private equity, which we'll talk about in a future episode as well. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, it's a big mess, right? Like, uh, first of all, you have to be really rich to get involved in the hedge fund. Uh, it's something that is restricted to anybody, but the 1%, uh, and, uh, after, you know, uh, on the back end. Uh, you're not paying any taxes on the rewards that you gain from being involved in the hedge fund, right? So there's a high barrier to yeah. entry. And once you're in, uh, then it's sort of like free money, right? Like then you're not paying back into the Commonwealth that allowed you to uh, um, uh, make those gains in the first place or that you continue to make money off the back of. Do you know what, but here's a, here's another just sort of aside. Do you know what uh, the, the financial industry jargon is? is for super high rates of return. No. Do you know the word? No. It's called alpha return. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, like, yeah. D- doesn't that say something about the world that we're, we're examining? Yeah. Uh, so anyway. I mean, like, uh, and this is the thing that like, you know, this is the thing that I'm going to like come back to again and again, because it's a ceaseless source of entertainment for me is the aggressively middle brow sort of worldview and tastes that billionaires push. It's like, and this is what I was talking about like a minute ago that, uh, you know, you have these unfathomable uh, stores of, of wealth uh, that you could do anything with. Uh, like, and, and this is like sort of like the dream of every 10 year old, like if I had a billion dollars, you know what I would do? And the, the only answer that any of them ever come up with is like buy a football team or a golf course or yeah. get my name on a building. Like it's all uh, well, yeah. so boring. And then, and then they come up with these sort of dumb names for things. Well, like, uh, yeah, it is pretty amazing. You know, whatever. I mean, well, speaking of that, Drucken Miller did try to buy the Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that didn't work out. Drucken Miller recently, a couple years ago, bought a house in Malibu next to Jason Statham. Sweet. That is an alpha <laughs> move, dude. <laughs> yeah. And he and his wife have a dog named Axel oh. that competed in the Westminster Dog Show. Sweet. Yeah. He operated a hot dog stand in college. Oh, yeah. That's cool. They all have that story, right? Like it's a, uh, it's like George Bruce. There's always money in the banana stand. Um, yeah. 
You're not impressed, I'm gathering. Well, it's okay. Yeah, no, I mean, he is, you're right. He's, he's sort of boring. Um, he kind of looks like a football coach. Like, to me, most middle-aged white guys look like football coaches. <laughs> 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 All right, Chad, so you're talking about Jimmy Haslam? James Jimmy Haslam. Uh, let me give you some vital stats. Uh, James Jimmy Haslam is most well known for being owner of the Cleveland Browns. Uh, he bought them in 2012. Uh, since that time, the Browns have become the worst team in the NFL uh, with an astounding record of 0 and 16 last year. Uh, 2016, they went 1 and 15. <laughs> And in 2015, they went uh, three and 13. Uh, many people have called Haslam. That is not good. Not good at all. In fact, like I, you know, I don't follow it that much. But like, uh, I think a, a season with zero wins is uh, is extremely rare, if I'm not mistaken. It's um, that's seriously bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of people have called him the worst owner in the NFL. Uh, I, I would agree with that assessment, but probably for different reasons. Uh, he inherited Pilot Travel Center truck stops from his father. Uh, in 2010. Can you just imagine an alternate reality where you, Chad, inherited a chain of truck stops from, from your parents? <laughs> like, like, what would that... Yeah. Can you even, like, begin to project yourself into that reality? Like, truck stop truck empire? Stop, yeah. Could I could I pull <laughs> off being a truck stop king? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I don't think I could. Um, okay. Well, just let that marinate. Yeah. You know? Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Uh, but Haslam Haslam was pretty good at um, owning uh, this chain of truck stops. Uh, they merged with Flying J uh, in 2010. You've probably seen them. You know, Pilot and Flying J are national. Brands. We've all seen them. Yeah, we've all we know what these things are. Uh, we know what they look like. We know what they smell like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, in 2016, however, uh, Warren Buffett bought Pilot Flying J. Sort of. It's one of those weird structured deals that rich people do. So like, although he bought the company, he's not going to become majority shareholder until like 2022 or something. I don't know how any of that stuff works, but Warren Buffett is soon to be the owner of Pilot Flying J. Jimmy Haslam uh, is on his way out. He's going to, I guess, focus on focus on those Cleveland Browns. Congratulations, <laughs> Warren Buffett, on a yeah. smart investment. Haslam makes some, some meager charitable donations. Uh, the big one that I came across is a $50 million donation to the University of Tennessee Business School. Uh, they subsequently named the School of Business after him. Uh, so he's, you know, as I said before, he's got those two big billionaire vanity projects, a business school and a sports team. Um, he's like classic, classic an archetype. Yeah, uh, super classic billionaire in a lot of ways. Uh, um, a couple, one, like, you know, one other part, uh, one other, a couple of other, uh, I think, crucial elements of his vital statistics. Um, Pilot Flying J is headquartered in Knoxville, Tennessee. Haslam's okay. brother is the governor of Tennessee. And okay. Haslam, well, Jimmy Haslam was college roommates with Republican Senator Bob Corker uh, uh, from Tennessee. Uh, so the family uh, as a whole is very, very tied up in uh, Tennessee politics, right? And they have been for a really long time. Very big employer, a lot of money in the state. Uh, I just want you to keep that in mind when we talk about what we're going to talk about with Jimmy Haslam, which is a big scandal that he is, well, is still currently involved with. Uh, it's still uh, uh, still going on right now. Uh, thus far, 17 people have been sentenced as a part of this scandal, uh, many of them uh, going to jail. Um, so what's 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 the deal? Yes. Uh, so the, the scandal itself is pretty simple. Uh, they, uh, it's a rebate scam. So the company pilot flying J would strike up a contract with trucking companies and say, Hey, if you buy gas exclusively from us, uh, we will later send you a rebate, uh, that subtracts from the cost that you pay, uh, from the amount you pay for the gas based on the cost of gas 
for us. So the cost, the, okay. the price of gas fluctuates, and so they're they they had they did what they called manual rebates, which means that they're calculating the amount of the rebate after uh, the sale of the gas. Uh, based on how much the gas cost them to supply. So far, so good. Okay. And so the, the, they would strike up these contracts, and uh, uh, what they would do is, is uh, they would manually uh, uh, calculate the rebate, but they would calculate it at uh, a, a way that uh, did not supply the full rebate to the trucking companies that they uh, were promised, right? So, uh, so just sketchy, scammy rebate. But yeah, basically, like, oh, we'll give you a rebate of five cents, you know, or we'll give you a rebate, and it should have been five cents per gallon, but they're actually only giving them four cents per gallon. But you do that ten million times, and you're making a bunch of money. Yes. In fact, uh, I have a quote here from John quote Stick Freeman. Uh, these are these are like uh, very uh, good old boys, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but, you know, they have nicknames and stuff. Uh, so John Stick Freeman, uh, he was an upper management guy who's been sentenced. Uh, here's how he describes it. I wasn't trying to fuck the guy, but we were doing the math. And if his discount was going to end up being 38 cents, shit, I'd make it 29 cents. I was sending him a check for fucking $900,000. Does he know it's supposed to be $1.2 million? Uh, so that was the, well. How was that not trying to fuck the guy? Um, I mean, that seems to be like the definition of actively trying to fuck the guy. Yeah, I, I, isn't that what he's like? I wasn't trying to fuck him. I just was trying to steal money. Yeah, no, I, I mean, he was. Yeah, he was very literally fucking the guy. Um, uh, and uh, <laughs> it's not just it's not just fraud. Um, uh, it was in fact uh, uh, extremely racist fraud. Uh, So, uh, as I said earlier, uh, they called them manual rebates, right? Because they calculated them after the fact. Uh, M-A-N-U-A-L. But everyone in the company knew them by their nickname and called them manual rebates. M-A-N-U-E-L. And the reason they called them manual rebates is because, and and this is in the uh, FBI affidavit, uh, the Wall Street Journal still hosts it, so you can go, uh, it's a 120-page uh, FBI affidavit that has transcripts of all of these secret recordings uh, made by undercover informants. You know, like this, this is just this huge um, uh, uh, scandal involving uh, tons of people, uh, the entire upper management of the company. Uh, and so uh, all of them, all of the upper management of the company called them man- manual rebates. Uh, uh, and this is, again, in, in many uh, transcripts of conversations that were recorded because they... And so the reason is... They targeted yeah. Hispanic companies. Uh, they called them manual rebates because they were specifically defrauding Latino-owned businesses. They were targeting Latino yeah, yeah. businesses. And, uh, okay. In fact, as one regional sales director in the affidavit says, uh, quote, they're not stupid. There's just... Uh, there is a language barrier. So you can get away with a little bit more... Because you know they're not going to understand everything that you say. Uh, and that is quote, unbelievably fucked up. Right. So they they would identify trucking companies uh, where there was a language barrier and just lie to them about what the rebate was supposed to be. Uh, and, just, and then just assume that yeah. they would get confused and not yeah, follow up. They just and, relied on people not calling them on their bullshit. And which they didn't do for a really long time. They got away with it for a while. Um uh, and we're going to, you know, I want to play some uh, some recordings from these t- uh, tapes, uh, you know, so like not only is. OK, the, let's let. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just not only is the FBI affidavit that, that lays all this out uh, on uh, the Web, but also they posted all of the uh, secretly recorded <laughs> conversations that people have, which are just and we'll play some of it, just filled with with racial slurs with they're playing this uh yeah, this david i don't even really want to like let's just listen yeah. let's just okay. roll the clip okay. roll the tape. okay that's right john we've known about these recordings and their racist undertones since a portion was played for a jury in january but today a federal judge released them these documents and this all unfolded during a sales meeting at a lake house almost six years ago just released transcripts make unspeakable words disturbingly clear. Former pilot president Mark Hazelwood asking former vice president John Freeman to play a notoriously racist song from the 1980s written by singer David Allen Coe. The song ends and the other former employees at the Lake House sales retreat chime in. 
So how's that such a dignity training coming along? <laughs> Adding to the racial slurs and vulgar language, those now former employees also made fun of board members, CEO Jimmy Haslam's NFL football team, and its home city. Either he's illiterate or stupid or drunk or just mean-spirited. Uh, one of those guys that you hear on there is the president of the company, Mark Hazelwood. Um, he's the one who got the longest sentence. Uh, Can we just register how disturbing that was, please? And, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I've listened to it a bunch of times, and so maybe I'm just, like, uh, uh, desensitized to it. But it, it is, I, I, you know, you can't really hear what the song is in there. Um, and, and frankly, I don't encourage you to look it up. Uh, uh, but just imagine the worst thing that you can, and uh, that's what it is. It's them. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so, like, Hazelwood got, I think, three, three and a half years in jail. Uh, uh, oh, no, no, no. I think 12 and a half years in jail uh, and had to pay a bunch of fines. The company had to pay um, a lot of fines and stuff like that. Haslam himself, strangely, was not charged, even though he is on some of these tapes. Uh, uh, Acknowledge some of these tapes where the scam was being discussed, where he acknowledges that he understands what the scam is. He's, Have you heard these tapes, yeah, or are these just are on you YouTube, quoting? right? Like, they, I, I mean, they're 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 public record. I mean, you can go listen to them. We'll, I mean, we're going to post the links, uh, so if you want to listen to them, you can. Uh, we'll even put on time signatures for for uh, when he's on the tape. Wow. Um, wow. No, wow. no charges for him. The company wow. had to pay some fines, but Jimmy Haslam. Uh, did not get in any trouble yet. Seventeen of the people that he worked for, or sorry, worked that worked for him, and uh, who he was friends with, who he promoted, who he knew for decades, right? Like, I mean, it's it's laughable uh, to to think for a minute that there could be a consistent, widespread, uh, uh, corporate. Um, atmosphere of of racism uh that uh everybody ascribed to uh jokingly except, calling ripping off latino haslam. businesses manuel rebates uh and haslam was not part of it. I, I mean it's, it's laughable to uh to and and he knows it's laughable right like he knows that nobody's gonna believe it uh and so i came across something that is it's too hilarious to not share um uh, in an article in cleveland magazine uh, about him and his wife, D, uh, making a $10 million match donation to a charter school network in Cleveland. And this was part okay. after people started getting sentenced. Uh, uh, this was part of a public relations uh, thing that uh, uh, um, that Haslam uh, apparently did uh, to try and, uh, I guess, soften his, his reputation with the people of Cleveland where he owns the team. Uh, so this is, this is an unattributed, it's a, uh, some guy named, uh, Richard Osborne, you know, no, what's the name of the magazine again? Cleveland magazine. No title yeah. given, just, a your, your regular old staff writer, uh, Richard Osborne, uh, wrote this beautiful, uh, and, uh, unprompted, uh, uh editorial about, uh, let's Jimmy hear Haslam. some of it. Okay. Uh, so he writes, D and Jimmy Haslam, owners of the Cleveland Browns, are here to teach us something. No, not that patience pays off. We were one of the most uh, patient cities in America long before they got here, and they certainly are not here to lecture us. That is far from the style of this extraordinarily <laughs> gracious couple. The Haslams are here to lend their time, talent, and treasure, the three vital resources genuine philanthropists share, to assist in the lessons taught to our next generation. And like, I just want to interrupt myself and say, like, the, the idea of having Jimmy Haslam teach lessons to the next generation is terrifying to me. Uh, if football is their passion, so too is the quality of education that Cleveland provides to students who are hungry to learn. All of which explains their $10 million challenge pledge to the Breakthrough Schools, a Cleveland-based charter system that serves as a role model uh, for charters that work. That language, you know, sounds very familiar. The Haslam's match promise is in addition to a $1 million donation they made to the schools last year, which in turn is in, a, in addition to numerous other donations they've made to organizations since they first visited uh, uh, one of its schools. So so it's just a puff just, piece. Just a puff piece, just glowing, um, uh, just, you know, uh, praising the heck out of Jimmy Haslam uh, after this scandal hit. And uh, and if you, if you suspected well, while I was reading that, um, uh, that it was a puff piece, 
piece. Uh, well, you would be correct. Uh, it was a public <laughs> relations, uh, uh, part of a public re- relations blitz. Uh, and uh, Richard Osborne, the uncredited, the, uh, uh, the, the right, his name just appears r- by Richard Osborne. No one knows who that is, right? So uh, I looked up Richard Osborne. He is uh, the former CEO of Gas Natural Incorporated, a natural gas company based in Cleveland, right? So like, oh my he, God. Uh, yeah, he's a guy who works with or for Haslam. Uh, and so uh, uh, I thought that was just unbelievably funny. Um, and, and like, and so unbelievably funny because it's a $10 million match pledge. So like they'll match up to $10 million that the schools are like, uh, so it's not even like a full on legit yeah, contribution. It, it could be. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. I didn't follow up and see if uh, they actually had to make the match. But uh, and also it's charter schools like there's, you know, it's it's really messed up. But the idea is uh, it's a face saving uh, move and it's completely right. fake. And, well, uh, we need to link to all of those things so that people can see for themselves exactly what the source material is. Yeah. Because so, it's really truly horrible. It is a it is a truly horrible scandal, and and I, and I think that like probably most people haven't heard of it, and I think that the reason people haven't heard of it is because the owner of the Cleveland Browns was not prosecuted, right? Like the guy who is uh, the uh, the public facing name, you know, uh, associated with the company uh, was not charged, right? It was a bunch of people below him, and and. It probably had nothing to do with his brother being the governor or uh, or knowing Bob Corker or just sort of like <laughs> growing up with the entire uh, political aristocracy of Tennessee. Oh, my God. That led to that. Right. Like uh, um, the reason like this is it was a huge millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, of scandal that specifically uh, ripped off a racial minority. Uh, like, I mean, I, it, it, the fact that it wasn't sort of national news for months, especially after 17 people were convicted and, and hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, uh paid in It's fines. pretty astonishing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's astonishing that, that it wasn't a story. And I, the only reason that it wasn't a story is because nobody's ever heard of Mark Hazelwood or John Stick Freeman, right? Like it's because. Are the, all these Hazel- guys in prison now? Are those guys uh, in jail? Woods going to prison. I think uh, John Stick Freeman got like three and a half years. Uh, where, uh, but Hazelwood is Hazelwood uh, uh, took the brunt of uh, <laughs> of the punishment, and uh, yeah, you know that's it in a nutshell. Okay, well, do you want to roll the roll the roulette wheel? I do, yeah. Okay, uh, the first person that our random selector uh, has chosen is James Coulter, two point one billion dollars, uh, TPG Capital owner. Uh, co-founder, oh boy, a uh, co-founder of Leveraged Buyouts, the largest leveraged buyout on record uh, is, uh, so Leveraged Buyouts, that'll be fun to talk about. Okay, who's the, who's the second guy? The second person, I, I like how you're saying guy, you're gendering it because uh, these are almost all men. Uh, the second person is Leslie Alexander. Oh, wow. Uh, the... Owner of the corrected. Houston, well, no, I think he's a man. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not actually sure, uh, but I think, I think it's a man. Um, that's, that's owner good. of the Houston Rockets. He's an attorney and a financier. Another sports owner. Maybe Leslie Alexander will offer us an opportunity to talk about sports infrastructure. Okay, I'll do. I'll do Leslie there. Alexander. All right, cool. And uh, I will do James Coulter. Sort of like a flip flop from this episode. Yeah, I'm a financial person. I hate reading about like financial stuff. I get so. You're going to do great, Chad. (laughs) (laughs) See you guys next time.